Hi there. Let's talk about wine advertising and promotion today. Um, before we get into some definitions, and definitions are really important so we all understand what we're talking about, I thought I'd share a little poem with you that's fun. The codfish lays 10,000 eggs. The homely hen lays one. The codfish never cackles to tell you what she's done. And so we scorn the codfish, while the humble hen we prize, which only goes to show you it pays to advertise. So let me ask you a question. What do media companies sell? When we think of big media companies, we think of uh, the New York Times. We think of NBC News. Um, these days, of course, we also think about Google. Uh, but the question is, what do they sell? And in the traditional consumer view of media, those companies sell content to the readers. You subscribe to the New York Times and they write articles and they have journalists who tell you what's going on. But that's not actually the primary um, business function when they write their business plan. Their primary stream of revenue is not subscriptions, it's advertising. And they're not really selling content to readers. They're selling readers to advertisers. So the answer to this question, of course, is B, not A. Um, they create content to attract readers, but ultimately the way they make their money is selling their readers to their advertisers. This is extremely obvious when we're talking about Facebook, when we're talking about Google. The new social media is quite clear on this. Frankly, the readers generate their own content, but uh, once the readers are there, those organizations then sell access to those readers. So when you think about advertising, what you're thinking about is how are we going to buy, what media are we going to use to buy the attention of those readers? Okay, make sense? Let's go on. So basically, you pay your message to get to the audience. And there are a couple of different kinds of advertising. Image enhancement advertising, gosh, don't we look good. Uh, immediate response advertising, come on down now or order your pizza in the next hour and get a dollar off. Uh, or, of course, what we're seeing a lot uh, when it comes to sports figures and the rest, I want to be like Mike, personality, identification, Steph Curry has his own line of shoes, all of that kind of stuff. So here's one of the great uh, quotes about advertising. I know that half the money I spend on advertising is wasted and the trouble is I don't know which half. Now what does he mean by that? Let's think about a wine company, for example. Let's use a big wine company. Let's say Gallo decides to advertise during the Super Bowl. Well, if you remember our lecture on the US wine market, um, about 75% of all Americans don't drink wine. So let's assume that the people watching the Super Bowl are average Americans. That means 75% of the people seeing the ad on that, on, on, during the Super Bowl don't buy wine. It's not intended for them. So that's what Lord Leverhulme was talking about. He spends money to reach people, but he's never quite sure if the money he's spending, wh which of the people seeing the ad are really going to act on it. Um, now, that gets better when you start doing things like Google ads that respond to search words. So if I look for Napa Valley Cabernet and I buy those words from Google, then the only people who will see my ads are people who are interested in buying Napa Valley Cabernet. That still has some limitations, of course, because on the one hand, you may be, someone may be searching that is a grower who's looking to sell grapes in the Napa Valley and he's looking for a buyer for his grapes not quite the same audience that you have for your wine, but still the, the incidence is going to be much higher in terms of those Google search words. And the second thing is people need to see ads a lot before they believe them. <clears throat> and Hal Reine has this great line, Hal Reine, one of the real fathers of American advertising. In advertising, less isn't more, it's less. If you run one ad one time, not enough people see it, and they haven't seen it often enough to remember it. But frequency is as important as impact in advertising. So let's talk about what advertising really can communicate. And one of the big problems that the wine industry has is we constantly talk about features, and we don't talk about benefits. Uh, benefits really can be summarized by that wonderful acronym WIIFM, what's in it for me? 
So the fact that you make your wine a certain way, what's in it for me? The fact that you grow grapes a certain way or in a certain place, what's in it for me? And so ultimately what wineries need to get in the business of selling is image. They need to be selling, look, who cares whether this stuff comes from calcareous soils or volcanic soils? The real question is, when you order a bottle of this, how will you feel? Will you feel smart, educated, sophisticated, in the know, clever, luxurious? All of those things are good. So maybe that's what the winery should be selling instead of malolactic fermentation. So important issue there. Second thing is, how much do you pay for advertising? And again, you generally pay for impressions measured in thousands. So Google Ads, for example, they, they break this down very simply. They pay you, uh, sometimes for Google Ads, you pay certain, just a fee per click through. So someone searches Napa Valley Cabernet, if they don't click on your ad, you don't pay. But if they do click on your ad, you owe Google a dollar. Um, that's a very simple way of doing it. Uh, the New York Times does something quite different. They say, look, our subscription base in your area is 300,000 people in California. I have no idea if that's accurate. I'm making that number up completely. Um, but 300,000 New York Times readers generally tend to be well-educated, generally tend to make this much money, blah, blah, blah. They give you a description of the average New York Times reader. And if you want to reach 300,000 of them, uh, a quarter page ad will cost you this, which is this per thousand. They will, they will cost it out so that you can compare. Well, let's see, I could do the New York Times or I could do the Wine Spectator. Now, the Wine Spectator is more targeted towards wine, but the New York Times may have, I may have less competition for my ads. Let's compare the cost per thousand. And that's one of the ways you really measure exactly what you're getting in advertising. And then, of course, the real struggle for a lot of people in advertising is what is your message? Uh, because most wineries, the message is we make really good wine and here's a picture of our bottle with a loaf of bread and some cheese in a beautiful glass and doesn't it look nice? And the problem is, I'm sorry, which winery did you say this was? Uh, could be any winery. So how do you communicate the unique selling proposition of your brand? How do you say, here's how we're different from every other wine brand? Very difficult to do in advertising in a believable way. Um, the second element, of course, is even if you understand what you're trying to do, getting it to work exactly right, using exactly the right image and exactly the right words. This to me is where the art comes into marketing, uh, one of the places that art comes into marketing. And it's really difficult, it's really fun to do uh, when you do it right, but uh, so many wineries decide, well, we, don't, we, we can afford the space we can afford to pay the wine spectator for the full page ad. I really don't want to pay somebody $10,000 to design it. And then of course, your competition, some of the biggest wineries in the world, go to that same wine spectator, buy the same space, and then hire one of the world's great design and communications teams to develop their ads. And you thumb through the magazine and you say, wow, that's beautiful, wow, that's beautiful. Boy, that looks like somebody's sister-in-law did it. And in the end, you are counterproductive in generating a positive image for your brand. And then finally, will it really reach the right audience? Um, we tend to think of the Wine Spectator as a consumer magazine, but in actual fact, I believe, shouldn't say fact, I believe that the Wine Spectator is a more powerful tool to reach uh, the distribution channel and the trade than it is to actually reach consumers. I think if you want to reach consumers, there are publications that do a better job of that. And for example, a few years ago, uh, I worked on a project with Sunset Magazine, was absolutely stunned to learn that the readers of Sunset Magazine, lifestyle magazine for the Western United States, they drank an average of 8 million glasses of wine a week. Uh, when you compare that to the Wine Spectator, the Wine Spectator turns out to be very small potatoes. So looking for how you say things, looking for what images you present, and ultimately looking for the right media channel, all of that is part of the challenge of doing good advertising. So what's right about advertising? Well, um, if you do it well, it can really be successful. And of course, I, the example we all have to use whenever we're talking about marketing is Apple because they have um, the best 
most valuable, most powerful brand in the world. And so, for example, good advertising, as I say here, can create an image of your company that will sell products and resist a huge amount of damage. It can help you own a word in the buyer's mind. Remember that a number of Apple products have come out into the market with problems. The first iPhone didn't work very well as a phone. One of the recent versions, if you put it in your back pocket, it bent and cracked. Oops, those are major problems. If those happened to another company, oh my gosh, that would have a big impact on their brand. But Apple, because of its longstanding work on the brand, because it has superb advertising, among other things, uh, the company was able to weather those storms quite easily. Second point, sometimes, and I don't want to say this happens regularly, but sometimes you can buy editorial coverage. Now, there are a couple of different ways you can do this. On the one hand, you can simply say, look, I'm your biggest advertiser. Don't you think it's about time you did a story on our, on our store, on our service, on our business? That can work, not very often, but it can work. And the better the publication, the higher the journalistic standards. For example, it will never work with the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but it might work with your local paper just on a sort of informal basis to call the publisher and say, hey, you know, we got a couple of things going on here. It'd be nice to get some coverage. And don't forget, I've bought $75,000 worth of advertising in your paper over the last six months. But the other way this can happen, and, and you see this in magazines, you see this in in-flight magazines and airlines, they'll have a special supplement. That special supplement is a paid advertising section. And the city of Charleston or the state of South Dakota or the wineries of Mendocino County pooled their resources and bought four full-page ads in the publication. And then they got to put whatever they want in there they write the article, they provide the news, they provide the photos, they provide the imagery, but at the same time it appears in the magazine as if it's a, well, it's called a supplement or an advertising supplement, but let's be serious, it's an ad. It's a big, long, complicated ad. Another idea for small companies, because display advertising, those big full page ads, or even the quarter page ads, those are called display ads, they can run into big dollars. Uh, last I checked for the Wine Spectator, $25,000 a full page, maybe 30, something like that. Um, but if you have only a few hundred dollars to spend, you can still put a little ad in the classified ads. Now, you know what these are because it's how Craigslist's, Craigslist works. Um, and it is at the back of every newspaper. If you're looking for an apartment, you know that you can open up a newspaper and there will be a listing of apartments for rent or houses for sale or all of that kind of stuff. Um, those are classified ads. But sometimes you can have some fun with this. And for example, Sonoma County for years had a very fun advertising campaign in the back of the Wine Spectator in the classified ad section. It was just a tiny little three line ad that said, which county won the most gold medals at wine competitions this year? Dial whatever the number was, an 800 number, and find out. And of course, when you dialed that number, the phone was answered with, welcome to Sonoma County uh, Wine Growers, or whatever the organization was. So very clever, simple way to, to get their message across without buying huge newspaper ads or huge magazine ads that would really run up the costs. And finally, as a last little note, ads can play a, a big role in distributor support. If you tell your distributor, look, I'm running these ads, um, it is a demonstration of your commitment to the brand. It's a demonstration of your faith. It's a demonstration of your support. And distributors appreciate that. So they say, oh, yeah, I've seen your ad in the Wine Spectator. Thank you very much. Yeah, you say, let's see if we can't pick up sales a little bit. And it becomes part of a bigger process of building the brand. Now, I happen to know there's a very clever company once that wanted to sell products into Lucky supermarkets. And so they took out a series of billboard ads for the product. They only put four billboards up in the entire country but they put them up directly between, between the head office of Lucky Supermarkets and the home of the buyer for Lucky Supermarkets. So when they went in to make their presentation to the buyer of Lucky Supermarkets, they said, you know, we've got this big outdoor advertising campaign. We're putting up billboards. And he says, oh yeah, I've seen them everywhere. Well, the only place he saw them was on his commute 
that was intentional, but it got the company a huge order from Lucky Supermarket. So clever way to show, look, we're doing these ads, you should buy our product, and that, that worked out successfully for that company. What's wrong with advertising? Well, there's a lot of problems with advertising. For most smaller companies, advertising is simply not cost effective. Um, it, is, it is expensive, it's hard to measure, it doesn't reach the target market, and a lot of times it doesn't convince them. Now, as somebody in the business, I was a little nervous about my kids growing up and watching ads and television shows and all the rest. And I do remember walking in, I think my five-year-old daughter was sitting there watching some kid's show, and I heard an ad that was really coming on pretty strong about, this is the world's greatest doll, every kid wants one, you've got to get one of these dolls. And I walked into the room to see what the heck they were talking about. And my little five-year-old turns around and looks at me. And with this wonderfully sarcastic look on her face, she says, yeah, right. Well, that's the problem with advertising is an awful lot of people see advertising and they say, you know, this is just some loudmouth talking about him or herself. Not believable. So problem with advertising, it is often not credible. One of the biggest challenges to advertising, how can you make it credible? How can you say something wonderful about yourself and have people believe it rather than say, eh, that's just you. Um, second issue is you develop a very clever ad and your competition in the wine business, often your competition is a bigger, more powerful company with better marketing teams and better graphic design teams and better advertising agencies. And you begin to develop a, a, a following for your brand and they come along and say, okay, we see what they're doing there. Let's see if we can't do that even better. Uh, to be fair to some of the big wine companies, they have a tendency in recent years, rather than trying to outdo you for your brand, they just buy your brand. So what the heck, that might be a, a worthwhile opportunity. And you look at Barefoot and Ravenswood and Prisoner and Mayomi and realize all of those brands were started by somebody who had a pretty clever idea and then eventually sold to a much bigger company. Another issue uh, with advertising is that it can force a company into a static position in times of change. Remember IBM, we're the computer for business. And yet as the world of business exploded, as the world of business transformed itself from making cars and doing banking to high tech, to, to creative, to innovation, to YouTube and, and Facebook, and suddenly IBM was stuck there saying, we're all about business and Apple is all about how you create an entirely new online world. Oops, kind of a problem. And of course, the last point, as I just said, biggest challenge with advertising is for a lot of people, it's just not believable. Again, don't forget your ads must compete with other ads to be successful. You've seen this when you watch cable television. Um, the local mattress store comes on and there's Larry. I have great mattresses. Come on down to my mattress world and we'll show you all about the best mattress and we'll get you a good night's sleep. And then two minutes later, there's an ad for Macy's or uh, Nordstrom or some large chain that also sells things like this. And you think, oh man, Larry really sounds like a local yokel. Not exactly what you want to do in terms of how you uh, present your brand. Are your ads better than the competition? Do they really communicate your unique selling proposition? Those are questions you have to ask yourself moving forward. Uh, and, and I would, again, don't do advertising unless you know what you're trying to achieve, you have a way of measuring it, and you know that you're going to do it better than the competition, communicate your USP, and actually do it in a way that's credible. So here's a wonderful quote from a book, because advertising does work quote from a book called Marketing Without Advertising. Uh, Michael Phillips and Sally Raspberry wrote an entire book on how to promote your brand without using advertising because advertising doesn't work. And yet here's a quote literally from their book in which they admit, we've all seen these popular ad slogans for so many years and they're so familiar that you have to concentrate 
to understand why they're either hype or simply not true. So that gets right back to the initial statement we were saying. If you do it well enough and you do it often enough, advertising really can convince people. Advertising as a, as a third element in this process needs to be done in cooperation with other things. Um, just saying we make really good wine, eh, not so good. But if you work out a program, for example, where you advertise to the people who are also involved in uh, corporate networking of some kind, so why not, uh, again, provide your wine uh, a, a special coupon for a special tour of your winery and tasting room visit to everybody who buys a new Mercedes E-Class car. Well, now you're positioning yourself with Mercedes. Uh, you are then offering the buyer's perfect target market for you, uh, a benefit of some kind. And then if you can add, include some advertising there where you say special guests, Mercedes E-Class, that then positions your brand as somebody who deals with the right kinds of companies. Um, that's what strategic alliances are all about, finding non-competitive friends who can build a brand. We once did a project with a winery down in Monterey. Of course, the Monterey Marine Sanctuary is one of the largest uh, in America. And they developed a program where the winery supported the Marine Sanctuary. The Marine Sanctuary, in turn, promoted the winery to its members. And it was a pretty successful program in positioning them as a winery tied to the local community, involved to what's important with the local community, and at the same time having an impact on a worldwide basis. Pretty good, pretty good plan. Uh, another element that you might consider in terms of how you how you tie all this stuff together is putting stuff the one thing wineries have to offer shelf space um, a another brand and another product uh, let's say and um, well, I was going to say Gallo salamis but that's actually laden with problems um, but let's say you work out a program with a local fine cheese producer and so as a result you have a coupon on your bottle that says if you buy a bottle of this wine and you combine it with a Laura Chanel goat cheese we'll give you a dollar off the cheese note dollar doesn't violate your more than a dollar limit on what you can do for consumers but it also ties you to uh, Laura Chanel very high-end producer and then of course the, the third element of this is Laura Chanel is delighted because now on the wine shelves the place where she normally has no presence whatsoever now you've got someone actually including an advertisement for her cheese in the wine department and, and the best of all of these possible scenarios would be you've got bottles in the wine department with a tag saying buy Laura Chanel cheese and in the cheese department there's a separate stack of your product saying buy this wine and the cheese and now both companies are really benefiting a lot. This is a very popular kind of promotion in, in supermarkets. It's difficult to coordinate but it actually works. And so we're going to talk about some examples of this. Um, POS, by the way, these are, these are things that you need to know, these little abbreviations. POS, of course, just means point of sale. It does not mean piece of, no, it means point of sale. And that simply means that this is a promotion that happens right where people are buying it. Uh, in the, in the gro grocery world, there's point of sale and there's point of purchase. Point of purchase tends to be the cash register itself. If you've ever looked at the products that are sold right next to the cash register, they are always the highest profit items in the store because people know those are your impulse items as you're standing in line waiting, oh, we'll take one of these two, bingo, you just made more money. But point of sale means you're promoting the product right where people buy it. Could be a table tent in a restaurant, could be a wine by the glass pro uh, program, something like that in a, in a restaurant. Uh, or, or in a retail shop. It's a coupon. It's a, it's a, a necker that hangs on the neck of the bottle. Uh, it's a shelf talker. It's a case card that tells some wonderful story or encourages people to enjoy springtime with Sutter Home White Zinfandel. IRC is an instantly redeemable coupon. IRC. Uh, and that simply means that when you are buying the product, you can immediately at the cash register get a discount. 
uh, they're pretty hard to do in the wine industry because they're illegal in a number of states. So if you're distributed nationally, there's almost no way you can do this. But if you're only distributed in one state, sometimes you can pull these off and encourage people to buy more of your product. Uh, and then co-op programs are simply the Laura Chanel is a co-op program where the two companies work together to do that. So let's talk about a couple of case studies. I apologize for the beeping, beeping trucks in the background. Um, Sutter Home. Sutter Home, America's Wine, for example, great, great promotion. Uh, they've done a wonderful thing where they have combined with a national marketing campaign to build a better burger. And they have competitions on a regional basis. Then they fly the winners of those competitions to the Napa Valley where they, they cook up for a panel of experts. So you get the experts endorsement of Sutter Home. You get the regional promotions of Sutter Home in grocery stores and the rest. Um, and then in the end, you get newspapers and magazines and websites carrying the results of here is the winner of Sutter Home's Best Burger. So it works on all levels. Distributors like this because of the local support. It doesn't just help the brand, let's say, generically and nationally. But it, oh, look, we can show it's happening right here in Atlanta. Um, it works for the media and it works on the retail shelf as well. So really good program. Very clever uh, and absolutely targeted to their unique selling proposition, which is America's winery. There are holiday stacks. You've seen these in liquor stores <clears throat> and in grocery stores. For example, if you sell champagne, uh, champagne, the displays for champagne for OND, October, November, December, are huge. It's where they sell something like 60 or 70 percent of all their product for the course of the year. So holiday stacks, those displays, those promotions, those are hugely important to their business and they spend fabulous amounts of money to create exactly the right presentation in the wine shell, uh, shelf. Um, it's interesting to think about this because when you as a small winery think, oh, we should do something for the holidays, you generally start thinking June, July, August, let's create something. You've got it ready by September. You walk into the stores in late September. Have we got a deal for you? I just need to tell you that most of those big promotions by major wine companies are presented in June and July to major chains. That stuff is all tied up already before it has even occurred to you that you probably ought to do it. And that's because those big companies are smart, they think ahead, and they know how much is at stake. Um, instant redeemable coupons. Yes, they can generate instant sales. And they're, you know, if you remember our study of the uh, Constellation Wines uh, psychographic study of wine consumers. One of the groups they had was the Bargain Hunter, uh, an, uh, AKA the Coupon Clipper. They're always looking for a good price. But remember, price is also how consumers measure value and quality. So consumers may look at the wine and say, ooh, this is a $10 wine and I get it for eight. But after they bought it a couple of times at eight, for them, it's no longer a $10 wine. For them, they look at that product and say, eh, I'll wait till I have a special and then I'll buy it at eight. And this explains, for example, the huge number of uh, the five cent sale wines that are available in BevMo. Those wines generally don't sell at full retail price. And then when BevMo has the five cent sale, they sell a lot of that product. So what what's the actual price of that wine? Well, it's about half of what the shelf price is because it only sells during the times of the five cent sale. So they do, unfortunately, coupons do encourage trial as we learned in our discussion of what coupons do. They're designed to encourage trial, but once they encourage trial, they also tend to set a price that says this is, you can get it for this much money, and it's difficult to get consumers to move up from that price point. Finally, I want to do a really quick study of uh, Foster Farms. Uh, we once worked with a winery brand to do a promotion around Thanksgiving with Foster Farms and turkeys. Now, Foster Farms sells God knows how many millions of turkeys. Uh, and they were looking for a way to promote their turkeys outside of Thanksgiving. And of course, 
so they, they came to us and they said, look, we've got four or five companies. We've got a rice company. We've got a soy sauce company. We've got a, a, a cheese company. We've got a cranberry sauce company. We want a wine company. And we're going to put a series of recipes together in a little booklet. And each one of those recipes includes a coupon. So buy the turkey, get the booklet, get the coupon, buy the products, cook the turkey. Everything works perfectly, right? Everybody sells more. And in the meantime, we can say buy this turkey and you get a total of $7 off the price of the turkey because you're getting $7 worth of coupons. Simple, clean, hard to organize with all of those various companies involved. But we did a good job. We put together a, a good wine match with the turkey. We came up with a nice recipe for the turkey. And just before the whole thing went off to get shipped, we were all sent copies of the booklet. And I opened up the booklet, started thumbing through it, and thought, you know, one of these companies thought this through a little better than the rest of us. Because all of us, with one exception, came through with a recipe on how to cook this turkey. And here's the recipe for how to do it. Which is fine, except people who buy turkeys just went to the store. They don't want to go back to the store and buy more stuff. If you can't develop a recipe for what they've got in their house already, you got a problem. And of course, most of these recipes in one way or another said, what about ginger on your turkey? Anyway, they, they often called for an ingredient that you'd have to go back to the store to. Um, Kikoman soy sauce was very, very clever. And Kikoman soy sauce said, cook the turkey any way you want. At the end of that evening, you're going to have a bunch of turkey left over, because everybody always does. And you're going to be eating turkey for the next three days. Why not serve it one day as an Asian stir fry? You're going to have to go back to the store in the next couple of days anyway for something. Go ahead and pick up the Kikoman, pick up a couple of other things, make a stir fry, and you're golden. And I thought, boy, they really thought this through one step further than any of the rest of us, and I'll bet their program was more successful. So the more you can think about what it's actually going to be like, the better off you are. So in the best of all possible worlds, you have a strategic alliance. You're aligned with the Monterey Bay uh, Marine Sanctuary. And you talk to their members and they talk to your customers. And that's a strategic alliance that you use each other or you benefit from each other's contacts to build the brand. You do special events for key consumer groups. So you host a special concert at the Monterey Jazz Festival, or you do a promotion at the Monterey Jazz Festival off to the side for something else. You do a promotion in stores nationwide where uh, you, can, you can encourage people to buy Monterey sardines, seafood from Monterey, discount of a dollar per can on the sardines. Then you come in with your advertising where you talk about here's how important Monterey Bay is to us. We're the home of Spyglass Hill, the famous golf course. We're the home of Carmel Valley. We're the home of Point Lobos and the Monterey Bay Aquarium. We are Monterey. Uh, you do a newsletter where you send your information out to your wine club members and news club, uh, or rather newsletter readers, and you tell them about all these things. And you ask all of your partners to do the same. So the Marine Sanctuary sends out a newsletter to all of its supporters saying, this winery is wonderful. Um, it helps if you get distributor buy-in. So that's where you start using the relationships you have with your distributors to build that brand and to get their buy-in. Some of them are going to be really excited about this. Others, a distributor in, for example, Topeka, Kansas, marine sanctuaries, I don't care. The good news is most marine sanctuaries are in the ocean, although there is one in the Great Lakes. And if you look at where wine consumers are in the United States, 90% of them are within 100 miles of a coastline. So there is a marine sanctuary off New York, Washington, D.C., Miami, Houston, um, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Seattle. So you're getting all the big wine markets. That's a pretty, that's a pretty effective targeting there. Uh, 
another example of a distributor buy-in is that I once worked for a brand who came to me and said, look, we make wine, we sell wine, we're perfectly happy with that. I have a sister who is an adult and developmentally disabled. And she's in a program that provides her with a working environment and a living environment and a life coach. And it's a really great program and they need money. And I want to build a brand that will send money to that program. And all I need to do is increase distribution. How can we do that? And I said, you know, the way to do this is not to go through traditional channels. The way to do this is to go through the people in those programs in different markets and say, who do you know in the wine business? And so, in fact, they were able to find a couple of distributors in different parts of the U.S. who had relatives who were in one way or another either in these programs or hoping to join one of these programs. Those distributors were the ones who bought in and it was successful in those markets where distributors didn't have a reason to participate, a personal reason, they were less successful. And then ultimately, you do need to take a look at all of this and say, okay, we spent all this money. What did we get out of it? And again, I like the idea of measurables. With Google Ads, you can get measurables. You can see how many people click through. Um, if you have something in your ad that says dial up this number, call this number, uh, then you count the number of calls you get. Uh, click on this website, go to this website and sign up for our free. Those are ways of measuring the impact of advertising. They really don't want necessarily the traffic. They want to measure their advertising. So measure that advertising, evaluate the cost of it, evaluate the results, and see if it makes any sense. Hope that was helpful. I look forward to seeing you in a next lecture. I think we're going to do a little fun with merchandising and using your winery as a way to uh, promote, uh, as a visual and graphic to promote your brand. Should be fun.